That's what you've got to begin to do is figure out what gives you energy and do more of that. And then what makes you tired, stop doing that and find somebody else to do it. All right, who's ready to scale up their sex life? All right, that's tomorrow. All right, so we're going we're gonna to be doing something different here now. Jason, though, left one thing out of the introduction. You know, I absolutely love entrepreneurs. It was so great to see how many of you have your own business. Uh, I'm this kind of nerdy guy as well. Uh, and so what's little known is I am actually the secret love child of Bill Gates and Martha Stewart. So you're going to see it right here as it clicks. Let's go through. There I am. All right. So it's... It's a good pedigree. By the way, my uh, confidence monitors don't have the show on it. There we go. That way I can see it. Not there yet, but that's all right. I'll look up this way. So anyway, this is why we're here. What's interesting, 11,000 startups every hour in the world. So we're not hurting for new companies. And what's interesting, in the United States, 76% of those companies never get beyond the entrepreneur as the sole employee. And I would suggest that most of those companies are overstaffed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's going to be a rough morning, all right? I'm going to have to tell the audience when to laugh at my jokes. Here's why we're here, though, is really to focus on what it takes in order for us to... There it is. It's coming up. Everything's coming together. Now it's not clicking. There it is. Um, what we're really trying to do is figure out how to be one of those... 3% in the United States, only 1% of companies around the world ever get beyond those handful of employees. And I saw how many of you would like to get on up there. And whatever scaling means to you, whether it's revenue, your influence. By the way, I'm going to make a little side note. I, I've decided to kind of push back against this word impact. If there is a switch that we need to make right now on the planet is we need, it's not a men, women thing. It's this masculine, feminine, and we need to bring the feminine to the business world. And many of the women haven't been able to bring that either, uh, stuck into this kind of masculine paradigm. And so what we think is critical is the word impact. If you think about it, its synonyms are hit, strike. It's very masculine. It's very warlike. I think what we really want to do is bring influence. We want to bring reach. And so what we want to do is try to help you scale your influence to people around the world as we move forward. And so that's what we're going to focus on. We'll give that a try. Um, and so here's what it takes in order to do that. And by the way, Scott from, from Atlassian, he and Mike were sitting right where you were sitting in 2002. They had launched a company in Sydney called Atlassian. And today, just to give you a perspective, they took the company public about three years ago for $4.2 billion. And I just checked this morning, and their stock just topped $31 billion. And they'll tell you that what they learned that day in that workshop in Sydney was this. It requires these two things, absolute discipline and focus if you're going to move forward in doing it. And what the other thing I love is not only do these guys have gotten stinking wealthy as a result, they just bought the two most expensive homes in Sydney from the mining families that had been the original wealth of Australia. So we're really seeing it moving from the old industrial sector of last century to the digital sector of this century. They've also been consistently the absolute best place to work. Now they got number two last year to salesforce.com, but what I love is that they've done well and they've done good uh, in both cases. Super excited. Our latest unicorn up in the UK, Splash Damage. Our coach, Paul Lewis, was walking up to uh, Paul Wedgwood's Ferrari. And what did he see in the back seat? But a copy of Scaling Up. And so if nothing else, I want you to equate Scaling Up equals Ferrari. All right? <laughs> and if that's something that you aspire to, that's what we're going to figure out. And I've always loved this photo. We really thought that the automobile was going to put the horse out of business. But what's interesting, last year it was a $300 billion healthy equine industry. What's my first point? There are no bad industries. I don't want you to blame your industry. It's just bad leadership. I don't want you to blame the economy. Anyone, you should know this number, by the way. What's going to be the global GDP in 2019, the estimated global uh, gross domestic product? Anyone want to guess how big the global economy is? Close, 88 trillion. 
that is up from 34 trillion at the turn of the century. And what is considered the Great Depression meant that the economy dropped by 10%. That would mean we would drop from 88 trillion just back to what we were two years ago to 80 trillion. And if you can't figure out how to make a million or a billion out of that, that's your fault, right? So this is not an industry issue. This isn't an economy issue. This is a you issue. And that's why we're here. And we want to focus on that moving forward. And here is the fundamental. You want to do well? You have to be different. That's the essence of strategy. Otherwise, you're going to be commoditized. And one of the keys is you've got to do everything different. I want to start with something very simple, pricing. If you price the same way as everyone else in your industry prices, how can you call yourself different? And all the great companies figured out how to price different than their competition. By the way, you want to understand why they're decimating the retail industry? Amazon. First of all, how often does Amazon's prices change? Daily, by the hour. Not that I don't check a half a dozen times a day, but my book has moved from $15 and change to $20 and change just over weeks. Yet retailers competing with them put a sticker, this is the price, and the only time they change is when they have to try to give it away. And so you've got to, if, look, if you hire the same people that everyone else in your industry hires, how can you say you're different? So the key is you've got to figure out how to do your thing different than everyone else in the marketplace. And to do that, you've got to nail four decisions. And that's really the framework of the book, people, whoops, people, strategy, execution, and cash. Now, I know at any one time you're going to have an issues in all four of those. But look, if you want to scale four balls, you want to juggle them higher, you can only do it one ball at a time. And so I want to do a quick little poll. Grab your phones, if you would. Um, and I'm going to pull up a quick little app that we created called OnePG.com. And real quick, what I want you to do is give me your email address. Then you're going to get my insights. I'm going to give you mine, vharnish at gazelles.com. Or if you don't want to remember that, vern, V-E-R-N-E at scalingup.com. But you put yours in. We're, we want to get a sense. We're doing this research globally. I just reported some of it out at our CEO uh, Bloomberg Summit that we did last Monday in New York City. Uh, I'll give you mine, 80302, and then I want you to vote. What is your number one issue? People, strategy, execution, or cash? Mine's right now people. I'm in a big issue with a partner. Daniel knows who that is. I'm going to submit, and then what you're going to do is you're going to see a little graph like this pop up, and it's going to be real time. All right. We've got 35 votes now, people, 24 strategy, execution 17. Let's keep going. Cash just got bigger. You know, oh, people, look at that. People's moving up there. What's been interesting is almost every place on the planet, uh, the number one, except in Western Michigan, uh, has been people. All right, I'm going to set this up here. And I'll look at it in my pocket here. So you guys keep voting. And what I want you to do is I want you to remember, and I'm going to look at this here in a moment. That's going to guide where I'm going to spend more time over a couple of hours together. So you have, you're in control of my time here of where I'm going to put an emphasis. And I want you to remember what it is that you chose. Do I think it's people, strategy, execution, or cash is my next constraint, the thing that's in my way of accomplishing the influence that I would like to achieve. And then here's our dirty little secret. The knee bone connects to the thigh bone. Look, I really wish business was this well organized. But if you said, look, I think it's strategy. I don't think we're really different. Well, we've learned that maybe the root cause is the one just before it right there. Maybe I don't have the right people helping me put that strategy together. Or I'm not spending any time thinking about these strategic issues because I'm so stuck just trying to deliver on the products or services that we're providing. If I chose execution, maybe it's because I'm executing a mess. If I chose cash, maybe it's because my execution's sloppy, so I'm not really generating the profitability I can feed back into the business. And if I think it's people, well, maybe I don't have sufficient funds to get the talent that I need to bring into the business. And so what I want you to do is pay attention to the one that you chose and then look at the one just before as I go through these. And at the heart of our work is a very, very simple phrase. Routine sets you free.
Look, it, it, it's fundamental. You're going to get it from all of the workshops over the next few weeks. What you do, more of, less of, or different every day is, is the difference. And it's the set of routines that we really become well known for, including these fundamental disciplines. These were the original Rockefeller habits from my first book in 2002. And that is first, you being clear that when you wake up every single morning of the thousand things that you've got to get done, what is number one? What is the priority? Number two, the only way that I have really a sense of what I need to work on today, this week, this month, this quarter, this year, is I've got to have data flowing in. I've got to have a good gut feel for what's going on. I'm out talking to customers and I'm looking at my quantitative data as well, not my financial statements once a month or once a quarter. And then I've got to get in a room and meet, if nothing else, with myself and sit down for a few minutes looking at the data and then decide, all right, this is where I have to go to next. And so those are the three fundamental Rockefeller habits, setting priorities. And this is precisely what I taught Mike and Scott when they were sitting there in that workshop in Sydney, just getting their company started as they've scaled now to 30, almost 31 and a half billion uh, this morning in market cap. And there's one of the things we're well known for, this kind of day, week, month, quarter, year meeting rhythm, if you would, the heartbeat of the business. Because look, anytime you get a second person involved, even if it's a customer, it's a contractor, the number one issue is communication. And that's what starts breaking. Any of you in a relationship understand what I'm talking about. And this ability, both in your personal life as well as your professional life, to have this routine, this rhythm. Uh, you want to strengthen your relationship with your partner? Get on the phone for a few minutes every day and let them vent, let them share. Uh, and that daily huddle, both personally and professionally, is unbelievably powerful. We're going to come back to that. Now, this is typically a three-day event uh, that we teach to companies all over the world. Scott, in fact, he and his team attended the one I just did in Vegas uh, a couple of months ago. So what I do is I've got time really to share four practical ideas. And so first, we're going to look at under people, the number one question Bill Gates considered the best he had ever been asked in his business career. And I'm going to have you address that question here as well. Number two, what is the essence of branding? By the way, what does brand give you? Pricing power. And that's what you need in the marketplace in order to really get the margins to move this business forward. Look, you can, you can scale the business by giving it away, but that's not a lot of fun. Number three, I know you've got a thousand things to do. How do you choose the one? What's the key question I ask myself to figure out what is it that I really need to focus on next? And then last, there's a universal truth that if you want to make a lot of cash, you need to understand. And so those are the four simple ideas that we're going to spend some time on here this morning. So let's get started. And I really want to let me back up. We'll get the volume up. This is a guy who, rest his soul, scaled what is today the second largest market cap company on the planet next to Microsoft. Microsoft is still in the lead at just over a little trillion dollars this morning. And I, I got to host Steve, his very first public speech after being fired from Apple. And I still remember I had about 1,200 of you in an audience in the Bonaventure Hotel. And so we put together this little video tribute of who I think today still is the greatest young entrepreneur when I first launched the entrepreneurs organization the world has ever seen. So let's listen to some wisdom of Steve Jobs. Building a company is really hard. And, and it requires your greatest persuasive abilities to hire the best people you can and keep them at your company and keep them working, doing the best work of their lives, hopefully. I think one of the, the things that really separates us from the high primates is that uh, we're tool builders. And I read a, uh, a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least energy to move a kilometer. And uh, humans came in uh, with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. It was not, not uh, too proud of a showing for the crown of creation. So uh, that didn't look so good, but then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And a man on a bicycle, or a human on a bicycle, blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. 
And that's what a computer is to me. Uh, what a computer is to me is it's the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. And it's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. I was lucky. I found what I loved to do early in life. Waz and I started Apple in my parents' garage when I was 20. We worked hard, and in 10 years, Apple had grown from just the two of us in a garage into a $2 billion company with over 4,000 employees. We just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier, and I just turned 30. And then I got fired. And so at 30, I was out, and very publicly out. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true, and the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere. When, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit, because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work, and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And so that was Steve, and it, it is a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of worry constantly. And we're gonna get into that kind of mindset that you've gotta have if you're going to be able to scale. And I really saw that he did three things here, really understood it required this kind of, this passion, this purpose, and this persistence. And I, and I wanna come back to this idea of passion. He said, I discovered early in life, and I look, I'm a huge fan of Cal Newport. And Cal's the one who said, look, we got everything all backwards here. If you ask people, what are you passionate about? 99% of the plan says, I have no idea. That's not how it works. Steve did not sit around in Lotus position and all of a sudden become passionate about computers. What actually happens in life is you start doing things. And then all of a sudden you bump into something that actually gives you energy that starts actually working well. I guarantee you if, if it was not going well in those first couple of years, Steve would have given up and shifted to something else. So passion comes after you've been doing stuff and then all of a sudden find out, wow, I'm pretty good at it. And so I want to turn to a guy, Marcus Buckingham. And Marcus really gave me an idea and our teams uh, something that's probably helped me more personally than any other single idea, and it's this. You've got to understand what really is strengths and weaknesses. See, a strength isn't that you're good at it. And part of the problem in this room is you're good at too many things. It's one of the reasons why it's going to be really hard for you to let go and have someone else come into the company and take over marketing or sales or operations or go out and represent you and coach for you. Because look, you know you're good. No, see, I'm gonna back up for a second. Yeah, time management's important, but the business we're really in is energy management. And see, time's limited, but energy's not. And so here's how you literally have to think about your life every day. And we really encourage you, like, take a piece of paper out, and over the next couple of weeks when you get back running your company, you start to write down, and a buddy of ours, Andy Bailey, put it, uh, a list up, on, a, up on, a, on the wall that said, things that give me strength, give me energy, and what are the things that I do that make me tired? And then your job is to get the things that make you tired off your plate and delegated to somebody else. And so, a strength is only a strength if it gives you energy. Look, I was gonna be a lawyer. I nailed the, the LSAT test. I, every, every mock trial I'd ever been in, I won. But just today, send me a contract to look at. Just the fact that it shows up in the email, I'm already exhausted thinking about having to open it. And I've had to find someone, Keith Durkin, who can actually open those and face the music. You know what makes me tired? putting my PowerPoints together. This is, this is how precise you have to think about it. So I went out to 99 designers here in Europe and I found this unbelievable woman. I would not met her for years, but for a decade now, she's done all of our design work, Jun Yi. She is half Korean, so very creative. She's half German, so it gets delivered now. And I can just send her an email at night saying, hey, I need a slide that does this. And it shows up magically the next morning. 
And that's how you begin to really think through how you bring on team and contractors and others to help you scale the business. And so I'm going to dig into our first growth tool. Those of you that have got it, uh, open up to it. It's on page four. You've got it up here in front. And Jim Collins said, look, you got to get the right butts in the right seats. The problem is he didn't give us a list of seats. So I sat down and said, look, these are all the functions. There are no titles. These are the functions you've got to have in order to drive a business. And by the way, if you're a startup or a single person, whose name is next to every one of those, right? Me, 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 me. I'm head of company, marketing, R&D, sales, ops, treasury, controller, IT, HR, talent development, and customer advocacy. And then what you got to do is you got to figure out, all right, which one of those makes me the most tired and I've got to go find someone. So the very first part-timer I hired when I launched this company in 1997 was my neighbor, Claudia Smallwood. Claudia, I need somebody to do the books and I need somebody for a few hours every week. Now, these people you bring on board need to pass three tests. Number one, they have to kind of fit your culture, your values. Now, in this case, her husband, Bill, was a very successful entrepreneur in the community. We all knew that. She had, had, she had run the books for Bill early on, so I knew she got entrepreneurs. She got startups. She would understand what I'm up against. Second test, these people should not need managed. If you've got to look over their shoulders, constantly nudging them, when are you going to get me my financial statements? When are you going to get me the numbers that I need? Claudia didn't at all. She was very proactive. And number three, they should wow you. And every once in a while, she goes, look, Vern, I know you're busy. I remember those early days when Bill was launching the company and scaling up. But I see something interesting in the numbers that might be helpful. And I'm like, wow, Claudia, that was helpful. And so they need to really fit where you are and the size of your company, where you are in scaling. Number two, they really don't need managed. These people need to be independent. And they, in fact, are actually wowing you as part of the process. And June Yi did that day one for me when I had her do my first design that I needed accomplished. Now, I want to take it a little bit further. Ultimately on this list, I want many of you to realize you do not have to be the head of the company. It's one of the first things the entrepreneur has to come to a realization. You may have title of CEO or whatever is appropriate in your country, but it doesn't mean that that is the function you need to do. Steve Jobs, when he came back to Apple, the only function he chaired was marketing. Tim Cook did everything else, which was why it was easy when Steve passed away for Tim to take back over. So a buddy of mine, Randy Amon, one of my early students at this MIT program, had a small company in Baltimore, Maryland called ABL Electronics. He was building little cable assemblies uh, for computer companies. And I loved his title, founder and head of customer service. He was the only function he enjoyed. And he backfilled the company as he scaled it with a CEO and CFO and VP sales and marketing. And he only held on to the one. Long story short, he ends up selling the company to a $2 billion firm that became $10 billion, that's now $40 billion. And you can guess, there he is, his latest. He is the SVP of what? Customer care and quality at almost a $38 billion global company. He has stuck to what gives him strength all the way along. To thine own self be true. Now, if we look at the purpose, when Steve came back to Apple, he took a dollar as salary. He didn't, he didn't do it for the money. If anyone in this room is doing your business for the money, it's probably not going to show up. There has to be this higher purpose. And by the way, particularly with the rest of your team, helping you get rich isn't particularly a useful purpose for everybody else within the organization. And so for Steve, he shared it in that video. His purpose was to create the bicycle for the mind. And so we have this one page called the vision summary. There's just a few things you need to fill in on it. It's page 10 of your, your growth tools. And by the way, Daniel across these workshops that he's gonna be doing over the next several days is gonna kind of walk you through this more methodically. But right there front and center at the very top is this purpose. And we want you to be able to really begin to nail that appropriately, all right? And then persistence. What's interesting is on the 25th anniversary of Apple, they only had 9,600 employees. Not that that isn't good, but that's hardly putting a dent in the universe. 
as Steve Jobs wanted to. What's interesting is the real 10X occurred after that 25th anniversary. And this isn't an uh, anomaly. Just look at Starbucks. Starbucks started in 1971. They only had 100 stores at their 20th anniversary. They weren't even global yet. It was at the 25th anniversary that they really 10 x And what's interesting is Howard Schultz has really talked deeply here about what happened at this point. And that was the first time he got a coach. No one has ever achieved peak performance without a coach. Anyone who works out who doesn't have a coach knows that when you get one, it's much more effective uh, moving forward. And so, quick question. How many have been in business for less than 25 years? I want to see a show of hands. All right, you all have time. <laughs> Isn't that great news? And so, you've got to hang in there and persevere. Uh, in my world, it, Peter Drucker is the rest of soul guru of the business uh, book world. He wrote those 39 books. And what's interesting is only a third of those were written before his 65th birthday, he did two thirds of his best work after what is traditional retirement age in at least my country, the United States. I hung out in Barcelona for eight years. I saw many of you, how many of you saw me in Barcelona when I was there uh, for the very first Mind Valley? And Picasso loved to hang out there. And what the critics considered the top 10 paintings he ever did in his life, six of those 10 were painted after age 50. And four of those 10 that you see right here when he was 51. So look, we are absolutely innovative and creative in our 20s, but we're twice that in our 40s and 50s. And looking around the audience, that bodes well for some of you. All right, we still have time. So let me now dig into it. I want to get to that question that Bill Gates considered the best he'd ever been asked. And so we're going to look at each of these areas specifically. So scaling up people. We anchor it with a question. A question you're going to have to constantly ask yourself. It's one of the toughest as a business leader. Would I enthusiastically still be doing business with that person, knowing what I know about him today? My bank, my supplier, my customers, the key people I brought on. These are the toughest decisions for you to make, but often they're the constraint to you scaling. And one of the things that's challenging is that human beings are not logical. They are psychological. It's one of the reasons why, by the way, everyone in this room generally, we mess up pricing. Pricing is set logically, but that's not how people buy. Uh, it's interesting. You go to a restaurant. One of the things you'll notice, this was work done by Robert Cialdini, the father of influence. And they've got a wine list. And typically that wine list is listed from least expensive to most expensive wines. All you have to do is reverse the order and put the most expensive wine at the top to the least expensive and revenue will increase 26%. You didn't change a wine. You didn't change a price. And then if you anchor that wine list with a handful of unbelievably expensive bottles of wine at the top, you can raise the revenue as high as 250%. So a friend of mine, Anne Marie, is the soap making queen of her industry. And she's getting ready to do a new Kickstarter campaign for a package that she got. And typical, how many of you have used a Kickstarter campaign or any of those out there? Typically it's what? A dollar if you want to contribute to my cause, $10 for the t-shirt, here's what I'm selling for $30. And then I've got the granddaddy package for $2.99, right? She had something similar. She calls her team immediately. She says, look, reverse it. Put the $2.99 package at the top. Let's go down to the dollar. And then let's make up a package. $2,500. I will come out personally and make soap for you. She sold out the campaign in eight hours. It had never been done before. Just by understanding that if she reversed it and anchored it, because humans are not logical. They're psychological. It's one of the reasons why we also mess up compensation, but we don't have time to deal with that here. And I think generally one of the rules along the way as you deal with people, because you need people's relationships in order to scale, is you want to stay away from the a-holes. Because one of the things that we know is there is no I in team, yet they found it. It's actually hidden in the a-hole right there. All right. <laughs> I know, it's the only thing you're gonna remember for all morning, you know, you're all taking photos of it. It's, it's so sad, it's so sad. And look, everyone say, well, but Steve Jobs was an a-hole, but you're not Steve Jobs, okay? So don't think you can get by with it. And as we say in Spain, the bottleneck is always in the top of the bottle. 
So if we want to really face what it takes to scale, we've got to look at ourselves. We've got to look at what's between our ears. And that's why you're here, is in order to expand that uh, moving forward. And l let me share a really dark statistic. Entrepreneurs have the highest, we're, we, we are the cohort that has the highest percent of depression of any cohort out there. It truly is lonely. It's why I founded the Young Entrepreneurs Organization, now EO. It was based on a friend of mine, Joe Mancuso's note that it's okay to be independent, but no reason to be alone. And so uh, depression runs rampant. I can guess a third of you in here may be suffering some versions of that. The whole weight of the organization is sitting on your shoulders and your employees will never understand that. They never will. So I just want to recommend a guy. Uh, have any of you read Michael Singer's work? Yeah. So now I recommend that you read his books in reverse. You read his second book first. This is his biography called The Surrender Experiment. He was this hippie who said, what's his voice in my head? You guys, you know what voice we're talking about? And he, he asked a very interesting question. What if that voice was a friend of mine? And it was saying all this crazy stuff to me that it's, I'm hearing. But I still want it to be a friend. And that's what you've got to get your arms around. And so he wrote this. He did this thing called the surrender experiment. And what you'll see is by surrendering to what life brought him, he built a multi-million dollar uh, construction company and a multi-billion dollar software company. So it's a great biography for entrepreneurs. And then you read his first book, second. This is the runaway bestseller, Oprah Winfrey's favorite book. You've got to see the three-part interview series that she did with, with Michael Singer. And it's, and it's his, his classic that has actually helped so many entrepreneurs who are fighting depression get over it. We actually do an hour with Michael at every one of our CEO boot camps as a result. It's that important. So I hope you go out there and, and read his books. And I need you to do a checkup from the neck up which is, look, if you've come here playing not to lose, and that's one of the things that happens as you start to get success, that becomes your constraint because now you start to go conservative. You start to change the game plan. And that's the losing strategy. We see it right now in, in the World Cups and in, in, in sports. How many of your teams have been in a massive lead and then what do they do? They change up and start playing defense. At the last World Cup, 86% of the teams that did that ultimately lost. Playing not to lose is a losing strategy. You've got to really convince yourself that I want to win, that I am playing to win. That's the mindset that's critical. Now, I want to dig down underneath this, and I want to be real practical. The function that is absolutely critical to scaling, you've got unbelievable resources here at Mind Valley this next few weeks, and that is marketing. That is the function. It's why that's the, the function Steve Jobs drove the entire time that he was Apple. And so, his coach was a guy named Regis McKenna. Regis coached Intel, Genentech, almost every other Silicon Valley company, and some young student at Wichita State University. Moi, I'm getting ready to launch this global entrepreneurship organization. I cold call Regis McKenna. I'm a startup. I'm a student. And I share, you got to have a good elevator pitch. You better have a big elevator pitch. And I did. And he took me on his only free client he's ever had in the history. He still reminds me today. It was $80,000 to have a first meeting with Regis. I said, all right, I'm going to teach you everything I taught Steve Jobs and, and, and Intel and Bill Gates and all that. He said, but you got to do two things. I said, all right, bring it on. And he puts his finger up and I go, what? Your finger? He goes, first, you have to set aside an hour every week to focus on marketing. This is different than sales. And for, at the time it was me. And he would get on the phone. He didn't. He assigned a young guy, uh, Rich Moran, to me. And for an hour every week for the next two years, we had our marketing meeting. So how many of you guys have a marketing meeting? All right. Write it down. When is Mine's 10 a.m. every Monday of uh, Eastern Standard Time. And I've done it now for 30-some years. So first, you have to focus on marketing. Then he asked me the question, 
that Bill Gates considered the best question he'd ever been asked, and this is what I want you to work on next. And that is, take a piece of paper out, and Vern, I want you to write down who are the top 25, if you're a bigger company, I suggest 250, but for most of you in this room, who are the top 25, particularly the top five people, relationships, brands that you need to bolt on to what it is that you're doing if you're going to scale. And so, and he said, look, the bigger the names, the faster you're going to scale. Now I'm a student. I'm at Wichita State University. I have this dream to build the world's largest entrepreneurship organization. So I take a piece of paper out. I said, all right, I'm young, dumb, uh, broke as the song goes. First name on the list, 1983. President Ronald Reagan. I'm going to get the president of the United States to be the first president to ever utter the word entrepreneur. And I did. And I got invited to the White House and then consulted with the Bush administration. And then I wrote down Steve Jobs. I got to get Steve involved in this organization. He's in his 20s. If I get him to sign on, everyone else falls behind that. And Michael Dell. Michael had just launched. Still an acquaintance uh, friend today. He had me coach his son. Then I wrote down, who are the two big media players? Inc. Magazine and Venture Magazine. And I need to get to know their founders and get them behind this movement. And I wrote 20 more names. And we worked that list every week. 36 months later, I'm global. 1986, I'm leading the first delegation of young entrepreneurs to mainland China as a guest of the government. I've just thrown the party for Steve Jobs' first public speech after being fired from Apple with 1,200 of you in the audience. And I've got sitting next to Steve on the stage, Michael Dell and Mark Cuban and Kevin Harrington and Neil Balter and all of the hotshot young entrepreneurs at that point. And I've got Inc. Magazine giving me full page ads. They had a six page story on that particular event. And Venture Magazine, Arthur Lipper, still a dear friend of mine today giving me full page ads for our events for free. It was crazy how it worked. My daughter, who's 16, has launched a natural body butter business. And so the first thing I did is I said, all right, sweetheart, let's sit down, let's take a piece of paper out. And I want you to write down at least the first five names of who you need to get behind this venture in order for it to scale. And she knew four of them were like YouTube bloggers because that's where her generation really gets their information. She knew who they were. And then she wrote down number five, Joe Biden, who looks like he's running for president again in the United States, daughter, who we've now networked to to have a lunch. So I'll skip this story. I want to go right to a mere mortal. So I want to tell you about Tony Hartle. So Tony was an early student of mine. It's this MIT program. He opens up a sun tanning salon in Dallas. He's not Facebook. He's not Google. He's opened up a sun tanning salon. But we sit down and he says, all right, what brands do I need to bolt on to scale this thing? If you know anything about Dallas, Texas, what would be the biggest brand that needs a tan? And we the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, right? So he networks his way there and he becomes the official tanning salon of the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Now he's running radio ads. Hey, he could do it, but he wants the biggest name, the biggest mouth in Dallas to do it. And at the time he was single, so he gets his way to Mark Cuban, the multi-billionaire owner of the sports teams in Dallas. He says, Mark, guess who I have hanging out at my sun tanning salons? Mark said, I'll be right over. And he becomes Tony's spokesperson. Look, you are the official tanning salon for the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. And you have Mark Cuban, the voice of your radio ads. Folks, it's done, right? Game over. And he becomes the largest player in the entire region. Ultimately gets bought by the national player for a gazillion dollars. So he can then retire. His latest deal was wine and he got hair. Um, he could afford to get hair. Uh, <laughs> He then wrote a book, and I absolutely recommend it, particularly if you've got yoga studios and fitness facilities and those kind of businesses called Selling Sunshine. He was an absolute brilliant operator of the Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. He applied it to his sun tanning salon. So don't get me wrong. He understood marketing, but he also got operations. And he called me up a few months ago. He said, Vern, after 10 years, I'm bored out of my mind. I'm going back in the business. And last September, he bought his first Crunch Fitness. 
uh, franchise. He's just announced he's going to do 20 more, hire 1,000 people. Uh, he's got the first 70, as he said, and he's back in business. But that's how it goes. And what's he doing? First thing, figuring out what brands he's going to bolt on. When I launched this, I have 156 members of YEO. I decide I want to do an executive program. So I convince MIT to bolt their name onto the event and Inc. Magazine to be the media sponsor. It's game over. We had 800 applicants for our 60 spots year one. And that's what really, once I had that, I knew why EO, thus today EO, would be the global entrepreneurship organization of the planet. So take a moment right now. And who are those five names? By the way, don't put mine. All right, so take a moment. Media personality, a friend of mine, Karen Banke, was in that very first MIT class. Today she owns Juice Beauty, quarter billion dollars. Who's her partner? Gwyneth Paltrow. You get Gwyneth Paltrow to be your partner, it's game over, folks. And I was a student at Wichita State University, right? I, I, I had no brand, but I had vision. And so who are the five biggest names? Local politician, the right reference clients. Man, if we're doing business for that company, we'll get all the rest in the industry. The person who writes for your industry in the local publication or the national or international trade publications. Who is the YouTuber? Who is the blogger that influences your marketplace? If you're in the software business, if Mary Meeker doesn't say what you've got's brilliant, you better start over. But if she does, you're a billion dollars. Every industry has its influencers, and that's what you need to work. But it starts with the list. We're super excited. We just got Richard Branson to decide with all his centers for entrepreneurship, all focused on startups, to realize that the action is not with startups, it's with scale-ups. And they've chosen to standardize on my book. That's a brand to bolt on just recently. How do you do this? So you start by putting their name in Google Alerts. So I want to get to Greg Brenneman, the top turnaround guy on the planet. By the way, when Steve Jobs needed to launch iTunes, he took a piece of paper out. He said, look, I'm a guy that manufactures hardware. He was well known, but the egos in the music industry, you couldn't fit in this planet. He writes down the top 25 names. He can't get to anybody. No one returns his phone call. So he says, who do I know? And I know, ah, I know the drummer for the Eagles. And he invites Don Henley over to his house. They go on a walk and a talk. And at the end of it, he goes, hey, Don, you know anybody on the list? He goes, yeah, I know that guy. And Steve worked the list until he became the king of music distribution. That's how it's done. So once you know the name, first of all, you call their office. You get to know who their assistant is. This is how I got to Jack Welch at GE, Roseanne Badowski. And you become friends. My buddy, one of the founding board members of YEO, Dean Lewis, was 16 when he launched his limo company in New York City. And the thing he did, he was known for dressing up and bringing a rose to the receptionist of every company that he wanted to do business with. And he built a personal relationship with the receptionist and the assistant to the people that made the decision who was going to use what limo service. He became one of the fastest growing limo services before he sold it in New York City at age 16. This is how it's done. And then once their names pop on Google Alerts, you have a reason to email to say, hey, um, just tell Jack I love what he just said, what he just did, the award he just got. And that's eventually got Roseanne to set up a phone call with me and Jack Welch that allowed us then to ultimately partner with GE in the early days of me starting this company. That's how it's done, all right? And then I want you to get this book. You don't have to read it, it's actually a really crappy book. I just want you to get it and sit it on your desk and stare at it the rest of your life. Keith Ferrazzi studied underneath Regis McKenna, he was one of his prodigies, and that is to never eat alone. I wanna now give you the number one entrepreneur key performance indicator. I want you to literally measure every week how many people 
the right people you have breakfast with, coffee with, lunch with, second lunch with, third lunch with, afternoon, evening drink, because that's the most important thing you need to do if you want to scale. And that's why Jason uh, and Daniel and I had coffee this morning before this particular event to discuss the partnerships that we have here with Mind Valley and enjoyed the dinner, how Vision's master at this, of knowing not to waste a single moment of breaking bread alone, unless you do need that critical meeting with yourself, all right? And so never, and I hope you're clear, who are the five or 25 you wanna meet this three weeks? that you've really looked at the list, that you've reached out and that you have a coffee or a lunch or an afternoon with the right folks. They're gonna be able to move whatever it is you need forward from this event. That is the most important strategic thing that you can do. All right, let's switch to strategy. And here the key question is, can you state it simply? It doesn't mean it's simple, it's not simplistic, but if you can't state it simply, it's, first of all, it's gonna be really hard for the market to understand what you do. And so I just want to tell you two words. I want you to guess the company. We deliver pizza. Which company is that? I've asked this question on six continents and everywhere but Southeast Asia where Pizza Hut got there first. It's Domino's. Now let's finish it out. We deliver pizza. What was the promise? In 30 minutes or less or it's free. That's it. That simple strategy, simply stated strategy, made Tom Monahan $4 billion. He gave it all the way to the Catholic Church. It's a whole other story. Now, a lot of you are saying, but I do something slightly more complex than shoving cheap pizza in college kids' faces, right? Feeding their faces fast. And so, it's never been lost on this guy. Larry Ellison at Oracle, same deal, our exadata, and by the way, you, you hang where your customers hang, not on Facebook in this case, but international airports, took that recently at, at, oh, at Heathrow. Exadata is their database, that's the word they want you to remember, and it's not four, not six, it's five times faster than IBM, or you win 10 million bucks. Now, why would Larry Ellison do something so cheesy? Because it works. If you can't state your strategy simply, no one's gonna be able to get what it is that you can do for them. So let's now break this down, all right? And I want you to now make some decisions. So the first decision is, and I consider it the best strategy question ever popularized by this Harvard professor, Clayton Christensen. And I'm gonna give you an assignment. I want you to go watch a four minute YouTube video called Job of a Milkshake. Because only if you can understand the job a milkshake's doing for your customer in the morning can you understand how to build on that success or compete with it. And by the way, it's not nutrition. All right. So I want you to watch that video. Now I want to ask you a question. In one word, what is ultimately the job of all of our products, of all of our services, of all of our lives, if you would. In one word, what is the job of all of our companies in this room? Just shout it out. What's our number one job? Service, maybe. Replace, maybe. Love, maybe. Uh, by the way, maybe means no. I'm, I'm just, trying to, just trying to be nice, all right? Now look, I don't, I don't know if I'm right, but I know this is useful, all right? And the clue comes from nature. By the way, there are no straight lines in nature. That's something humans made up. And I only see them on hockey stick projections of startups. That's more how your journey is going to be. And what is the simple rule that nature's used for millennials, for the millennials, I mean millenniums, to get from Everest to the ocean? What's the simple rule? Go, well, go with the flow, I like that. Path of least resistance. Let me suggest in one word, here's your job, easy. At the end of the day, your job and your product's job and your service's job is to make someone else's job or life or the life of their customers easy, not hard. Got it? 
So, one of the wealthiest guys on the planet, building one of the largest companies on the other side of the planet. Jack Ma said, it's very simple. Our mission statement to make it easy to do business anywhere. This is why Ikea bought TaskRabbit two years ago. Now that the population's aging, let's add services to our product in order to make it easier for the elderly to pick up and assemble the products that we make into the marketplace. But I want to take it to a mere mortal status. So this is my buddy, Hank Morton. Hank, 20 years ago, 22 years ago now, launched a company out of San Diego called Baja Bound. It does one thing. Man, if I'm going to drive my car in the U.S. to Mexico, I need Mexican auto insurance. I am going to be the place where it's easiest to buy that. Today, he lives in Barcelona, 60-some hundred miles away from his company. He makes more money than any human being deserves to make. He owns this little niche within the larger insurance industry. And he does it all with six employees and a dog. That's his entire team, all right? So you don't have to scale to tens and hundreds. Just let's get five or six employees. Let's get clear what is the thing we're going to do. The job we're going to do is make it really easy for people who need to drive to Mexico to get the insurance that they need. In fact, if, who is the wealthiest guy on the planet today? next to Putin. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, right? And I know for a fact, because Jeff Wilkie, his, the other Jeff that runs that company is a friend of mine. Every Monday, they obsess about one thing. How do we make it even what? Easier for people to get what they need immediately. That's all. You, you want an assignment every week? What do we have to do this week? So take a moment now. I want you to work on this. What's not easy? <laughs> In your business? Is it not easy? Is it easy to find you? Is it easy for people to figure out what it is you can do for them? Is it easy for them to order from you? Is it easy for them to get a call back? Is it easy for them to get a quote? Is it easy? And all you have to do is systematically 1% a week compound interest as your friend is figure out how do we make it just a little bit easier every week? And ultimately you can have the most killer app on the planet. But if it's not easy to use, what? It's dead on arrival. That's why user interface is so critical with everything that we do. When we talked about the strengths versus weaknesses, it's really, what do you find that's really hard in doing your own job within that business? And then what do you do to find people that can make the hard look easy moving forward? Th this is the path. Nature's path is to always take the easy route, not the difficult route. And I think we get confused by that. So this will be something you can focus on every day of every week. Side note, as you get employees, therefore, what do you think your job is as the leader? How do we make their lives easy, not hard? And by the way, most employees view their boss as, man, that person's trying to make my life miserable. And so if you can just focus on easy, care, love, but care and love are just too hard for me to get my arms around. They're too ephemeral in some sense. Easy I can get. And that's why we find it's useful as a way to think about the business. So what are you going to do to make things easier? Now, we're going to dig into our what we call seven strategies. Man, if you don't get the strategy right, you're going to waste the next three years of execution. And that's why it's important for us to focus on it. So we took all the best kind of strategy theories in the world. I bunched them all together, put them in a martini shaker, and out came this thing we called the seven strata. Now, we're just going to work on a couple of the items, number one and number two. And the first question is, what is brand, the essence of brand? It's owning some very important real estate. That is mind share around a word or two. When I say the word Google, what word does Google own in your mind? Search, right? And they own the word Google, and those two have become synonymous. By the way, it becomes such a problem that all the other businesses that they got in, they needed to spin out and put under a different brand, Alphabet. I all wish upon you the same problem Google has had, right? By the way, who'd they steal that word from? Yahoo. And Yahoo never recovered. You want to you weaken your competition, steal their word. 
from them. And Yahoo never figured out. None of you could ever figure out then what job Yahoo could do for you. See, the word or two you own describes the job you're doing to make people's lives easier. Google has absolutely made it easy for us to figure out anything, find anything. Dr. Google, if we're even ill. Right? I love this. I'm down in Sydney, Australia again. You can't say it any simpler than this. We're number one in the number two business. Now, if you need translation, they pump poop, right? And if you don't need poop pumped, you don't need to do business with this company. I'm, I'm fly a lot through Turkey. I see this article about this young artisan or this single artisan who loved to carve wood as a, a child. And he ended up getting a job then at a furniture company where he's carving kind of uh, tables and dining room sets and things like that. And then he decides to specialize. He just wants to carve doors, wooden doors. Ornate wooden doors. No, ornate wooden doors for churches. No, ornate wooden doors for Christian churches. And this lone artisan, now, the, literally, the market beats a, uh, a path to his door. He delivers these ornate wooden carved doors for Christian churches. He'll do a mosque or two if he needs to. Um, by the way, what are his marketing costs? Customers now stand in line to what? Hope he chooses their project. What's his pricing power? What's his margins? And how do you know if you own a word or two? You Google it. Look, even if you're local, if you aren't the best Italian restaurant in Atlanta, it's game over. Because that's what people are going to search for. And you better be working that. Now, I messed up. I'm the growth guy. And by the way, I know I own it anywhere on the planet, because even though it's geo-specific, you put in growth guy, you find me. The problem is nobody cares. When's the last time you were sitting around thinking, man, I need a growth guy? Unless it's like Viagra related or something like that, and that's not my deal. I'm Cialis. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> hey, quit laughing. That's... So we figured out that, look, it's scaling up. That term has really caught on. People want to scale ups. They're talking about not startups now, scale ups. So we own the URLs and we're getting about that uh, business. Now, something, one of the things I love entrepreneurs get to do is we often get to make new categories up. So Darius Bickoff knows he can't own water like nobody could own automobile, but safe automobile Volvo had for a long time. Great driving experience. That's BMW. So he said, I'm going to create the first new beverage category in 25 years. He labeled it enhanced waters. He just took water, added vitamins and minerals to it. You know it as vitamin water. He called it energy brands. And then what you want to do is you want the media to independently label you the king of, the queen of, the godfather of, in this case, enhanced waters. He didn't care that any of the customers do. The only way you're going to make a gazillion dollars in this industry is ultimately sell to Coke or Pepsi. He got him in a bidding war. And when the dust settled before his 40th birthday, he sold this company to Coke for $4.1 billion. Don't you wish you had just taken some water? Added some vitamins and minerals to it instead of doing the stupid business that you're in, right? <laughs> you could probably get passionate about water as well. <laughs> so you want to create the category. And it starts with your name. I, I, look, I just want to be honest. A lot of entrepreneurs I meet have like just these stupid company names. And that was the same with my hero, Carrie Smith. I finally got to share a stage with him last year. Carrie had this company that makes these fans. You've seen them in airports and the like. And the company was like called VTCH Technology. Something was like low, velo low velocity, high. Look, I can't even remember. Nobody could. And everybody would call in and say, are you guys the ones with the big ass fans? <laughs> so Carrie's like, shit, let's call it big ass fans. He then changed his title to Chief Big Ass. <laughs> and guess what? Got more publicity than any industrial manufacturer deserves to get. Last year, he sold the company for gazillion, no, 
half a billion dollars. It was a pretty good exit for this entrepreneur who was just making fans. So I got to tell you a story about a mere mortal. Good friend of mine out of Barcelona, Alberto. Alberto's got three employees. He's figured out a whole new way to do SEM. By the way, how many SEM firms are there? Search engine marketing firms. A gazillion, right? Every student who can't get a job but knows how to put a Wix website up is all of a sudden in the SEM business. And like this young kid in his 20s, he names the company Klaxon. It sort of had uh, this techie name. And now things are starting to catch on. His difference is what he does is he optimizes using physics and high-level math. His employees are all physicists, math quant heads out of Wall Street. He can optimize not 50, not 50,000, 50 million keywords, 150 million keywords. So now he's ready to go big. The first thing we say is, you got you to change the name. It sounds stupid. And then we looked it up and we found out that Klaxon actually in the Urban Dictionary means clitoris action. That's not going to work maybe for another site, but not for this one, okay? Uh, I told you we were going to talk about sex. All right. So the first thing we did is he said, look, all right, I want a name that connotes luxury. I want to be seen as the luxury brand of this industry. And then he reasons, almost all luxury brands are what? What do they have in common? They seem to be two people's names, like Dolce and Cabana, Mercedes Benz. You can just you can go down the list. It's, it's a very interesting thing. And so he says, ah, I'm going to pick two great mathematicians' names. And today the company's called Gauss and Neumann. And the website looks like a million dollars. His first major client, Iberia Airlines, he only increased the revenue 108% the first year. He then landed. Now, he had a second problem though. Let me tell you the biggest mistake almost all service companies make. And how many are service businesses? Yeah, right, versus product businesses. See, product companies, you know to name everything, right? Every, you know, nutritional bar you've got and every product line you've got and everything you got, you give a name to. 3M's got 55,000 of them. But service companies, you don't name anything. So nobody can point to say, we do that Rockefeller Habits thing. We do scaling up. You need to sub-brand your unique approach to service. So this is what we're working on next with him. So we go to a meeting and I go, Alberto, explain how you, what you do is different than everyone else. And he says, and he shows me this diagram and I want you to go to the website and see it, but I make a very long story short. You guys know what mass marketing is. So we coined a term mask marketing, which stands for massive array of structured keywords. And that has become as big, if not bigger brand than the name of his company. Folks can't remember the name of the company, GNN. He's shortened it just like Dolce & Cabana has to D&G. But they do say, hey, we're the, we use those guys that do mask marketing. And so I want you to go create a brand, a sub-brand. I want you to brand everything that you do so your customers can point to you. We have a unique way of doing yoga. Give it a name, all right? Not just the name of the company. My early students are the ones who scaled up Rackspace, the ones who provided hosted servers that a lot of us used as startups. They were our startup servers when I launched Gazelles. And the smart thing they did early on is they branded their approach. And they called it fanatical support. And they became better known for the brand fanatical support than they did their own company name, Rackspace as they scaled it and sold it for $7 billion. So that's how it's done. Even this private equity firm that we were partnered with, what they do for companies, they call Sparkle. And they just bought a client of ours, Dwyer Group, and the first thing they did is said, that is a stupid name. You have a whole bunch of home service businesses. So they rebranded it, Neighborly. So I want you to go back and rethink. We had to. My company's name was Gazelles. It worked for a while. That's the name you give to fast growth companies. Problem is nobody can spell it. Is it one Z, two Zs? How many Ls? Is there an S? Not an S. So I named the book Scaling Up. So the company is now called Scaling Up. And all you have to do is go to Vern at scalingup.com and you're going to find everybody. 
within our company. We even thought through, nobody can remember folks' last name. Your, your, your email address should be just your first name and then whatever. Otherwise, I can't find it easily when you're trying to go through your outlook to find somebody's because I remember your first name and I put in Vern and if, got it? It's about easy to spell, easy to remember. Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, all the great companies don't have these stupidly dumb long names that many of us do. Second. All right. So next what we want to do is strata number two. Robert Cialdini, father of influence again, says, if you want to convince somebody to buy your product over somebody else, your service over somebody else, you want to give them three reasons. Three trumps, two or four or a list of ten. And Francis Fry, the great strategy professor at Harvard, said the biggest mistake you make is you all go out and talk to the same customers and the customers all want the same thing. And by the way, if you're not careful, customers will what? Want, 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 want you right to bankruptcy. Customers want more. They want to pay less. There's the train wreck called commoditization. What you've got to do is be clear. What are the three? Not the two, not the four. The three things. And clearly, we're going to lead with the one, 30 minutes or less. And so one of our clients uh, is a family out of the Philippines. They've been in the shipping business. Yet the Philippines have had two of the worst ferry disasters in the history of the industry. They have 7,000 islands, like the 1,000 islands here that need to be networked. And so they said, this is very missional. We need to create a safe way, an easy way for people to get in the Philippines among their beautiful islands. So they launched the company. Uh, they've been, been fanatical fans of scaling up from the very beginning. And they said, Vern, you're going to love it. We took to heart your advice around the three brand promises. And we even painted them right on the side of the ferry. First and foremost, we are very safe. We are very fast. And we are very convenient. And right there, we know exactly, and now our hundred, now thousands of employees, as their BHAG is to have 30 of these ferries, they now have 22, up from the original seven that they bought to get the company launched. One of the fastest growing transportation companies in the world. And it's right there, front and center of their website as well. And so I want you to work on these three weeks. What are the three reasons? And the one you're going to lead with, most importantly, safe. And that's what they wanted to bring to the Filipino people uh, in their delivering on that. One of our uh, denti dentistry is hugely competitive. And one of our best dental clients in the UK, look, they make it very simple. Yeah, we know that you better be able to fill the teeth and clean them properly. That's what we call table stakes. If you can't do your business, then get out of the business. But how are you different how fast do we answer the phones? Were you seen on time? And most importantly, I don't care what we do to you, you're not gonna feel it. And a child can fill that out. And then they add the net promoter score at the end of that. There's the three, not the two, not the four, the three. And they ask every patient after their appointment, did we deliver on those three? And if you look at our one page vision summary, we already talked about the purpose right there is where you're gonna put those three brand promises. Take a moment. What do you think are the three reasons? No, no, you're not going to figure it out. So I had in that same workshop with Scott Fuqua, Naomi Simpson. Naomi's this ex-marketer out of Apple who decides she wants to do something. She has a purpose in Australia. I want to change the way Australians think about gifting. Let's gift experiences, not stuff that's either consumed or wilted within a week. Today, she is a $100 million company, but back then, she had barely sold 75 of these experiences. And I said, Naomi, tell me why people ought to do business with you. And she goes, well, it's easy. Number one, our branding, red balloon, everything's red. It's like the, the Tiffany turquoise. She only wears red out there in the, in the public. You get a red car, obviously, with a red balloon. So the branding she nailed, which you'd expect if she's an ex-marketer exec from Apple. Next. Unbelievable website. We make it easy for people to sort through the 2,500 experiences that we offer for them then to choose the right one for their friend or colleague. And then number three, we'll actually have somebody on site 
that day to help out if there's any problem. Something you're not going to get necessarily if you. So she had it nailed until she went out and talked to customers. And she bumps into a friend of her slash customers. He thinks going, hey, so what do you think about the business? By the way, things aren't moving. She's not scaling. She can't figure it out. And he goes, Naomi, I absolutely love your branding. It's so cool the kind of service I hear you provide. And I particularly love your website. And I use it to figure out what experience I'm going to give. And then I buy it direct. And she goes, why? Because everything else is, what? He just assumed he was going to be paying, what? A lot more. And that's when she realized her number one brand promise needed to be, not low price, but to be a pricing guarantee. That you go through us, you will pay no more than if you go direct. Plus, you then get the branding and the keys and all of that. Now, being a smart marketer, she didn't call it price guarantee. She went and created a new brand called pleasure guarantee to kind of play off of that sex sells. And today, she's a $100 million company, judge on the Shark Tank show, one of the most famous Australians next to Scott. And they were both at that same workshop and have done extremely well. That's how you think about it. Execution. Here, if you don't have relentless repeatability, and I'm not talking about Six Sigma quality, though some of you, my daughter has to have that with her skin care. Um, but can you at least get the invoice out on time? And is it accurate? And by the way, is your invoice easy for them to pay? And that's where these routines set you free, including our meeting rhythm. Now, we're not going to have time to dig into it. Daniel, are you going to do one of the sessions on meeting rhythm or not? The third session? All right. But in essence, it's this day, week, month, quarter, year rhythm that we think is critical for you to get organized around. And I want you to realize with any project. So... Daniel, our partner, John Ratliff, sells his company for a gazillion dollars and decides he wants to launch a WeWork space, but for scale-ups, not startups, called the Line Dot Space. So he buys this old, brilliant, beautiful bank, and he pulls the team together. There's John and his team on the right. There is the design and construction team on the left. Notice the happy faces at the beginning of this project. <laughs> You know, you're hiring a digital marketing agency to help you. You're, you know, you're doing a real estate project. And this whole thing very quickly, what? Gets over budget and it's going to be a gazillion months late. And so we're on a call. He's on our council call every 9 o'clock on t Monday. And John wouldn't have thought to run his call center businesses without every one of his 650 employees in a daily huddle. He goes, oh, my gosh. I'm going to start a daily huddle. So 7.58 every morning, the team that touched this project jumped on a call real quick, just for a few minutes. And they went through our agenda. The project that was running five months late got delivered in the next five weeks. Now, they couldn't make up for all the money they'd lost, but they, the rest was spent properly. And he wished he'd done it for the very beginning. So if you need to get anything done... If you want to move faster, you pulse faster. So you want to dig into that, that piece of the, the workshop that Daniel's going to lead. By the way, there's the project, huge success, scaling up. The key is this, one of my favorite quotes of all time, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. But it's hard when a thousand things are coming at you at any one moment. And so I want to turn to Mark Zuckerberg. Mark, I would never bet against half a trillion market cap. He's going through hell and back. But the kid's, heck, in his early 30s. When he went public, he took 10x off the table off of everybody else. This kid is smart. This kid knows that every quarter... He pulls his team together, and it's not the five, not the three, but the one priority we're going to work on. So he's getting ready to take the company public. Our fortune uh, editor said we're going to send our two best writers out. We know Mark's going to announce them going public, but they get to the meeting. They can't believe it. Mark Harley mentions it in passing. Yeah, I've got that IPO. What I need you guys to do is put your heads down, stay focused, and get us mobile. Overnight, people quit using PCs and moved to mobile devices. Now, in the meantime, Saad goes 38, collapses to 19. We're beating him up in the marketplace, but he doesn't care because it's not his number one priority. And sure enough, they focused on it. Within a few months, they pivoted from laptop to mobile, 
And in the next 18 months, 98% of their revenue growth came from that new um, channel. He could have done 999 other things. And running a company the size of Facebook, you know he's got those problems. But he knew the thing that needed to be done next, and he did it. And the rest is history. If he had not gotten mobile, they would be that light blue line. And if you have that kind of flat revenue growth, that's not good as a public company. What do we call that light blue line? Yahoo. Yahoo failed on two fronts. They never got a word owned in your mind after they lost search to Google. You could not figure out how Yahoo could make your life easier. And number two, they never got mobile. Oh, yeah, the stock responded, and it's 10x what it was at the $19. Um, here is the number one business book ever written. I shared this when I was in Barcelona. If you can only want to read one business book, you throw my book out the window, and you get the late Eli Goldrath. This is Rayleigh's book called The Goal. How many of you guys have read The Goal? Not enough. Uh, it's a parable. You can read it very quickly. Now, Eli taught us two things. Number one, don't smoke. He died of lung cancer, same year that Steve did. Also, you don't want to die the same year somebody like Steve Jobs dies because it sucks up all the media attention. That's, that's a sick joke. All right, number two, this is the idea. I'm a little sick. It's called the theory of constraints. Everything I've been talking about is this. What's constraining you? You start with what's between your ears that's constraining you. Hopefully, that's going to get addressed over the next few weeks. What's constraining inside your business? What's constraining the industry? Ultimately, what's constraining the market? And if you can figure those out. So I want to take you back to my second book. And look, if you're going to be a great student of business, I think you should read its history. Like a great architectural student ought to read about the best buildings like the Sagrada Familia and, and uh, what we've seen here in Pula. And in there, I tell the story of Robert Taylor. So Robert decides... The market needs liquid soap. Some of you are too young to know that there was a time we only had things called bars of soap. And you don't know whose body parts they'd touch last. Don't even want to go there. He launches it, 1980, goes to 39 million its first year. Now he's getting ready to go into year two. What's his constraints? Cash, distribution, office space, all the messes that come. And he could have addressed those 900 things, but if he'd missed this one, he would he wouldn't have, he would have lost it again. He said, look, he got wind that Colgate Palmolive was going to steal his idea. That's when you know you've got something, is when people are going to steal it, right? How is he going to control his destiny? And he said, the constraint is the pump. There's only one company that makes them. This, we're talking about three years before even Tiananmen Square, all right, or six years before that. It's, China's not even on the radar as a manufacturer. It's a company in California. He goes and visits them. Hey, what's the biggest order you guys ever filled? They goes, yours, $5 million last year. He said, how many of these do you make a year? And they go 100 million units. He goes sold. He negotiated a 12 cent price, $12 million purchase order, a million a month for the next 12 months, hoping he could grow out of it. And he did. And when Colgate Palmolive wanted to jump into the market, guess what? There's no screen pumps, right? There's no, there's. So they end up ultimately buying his company for a gazillion dollars. <laughs> it's a technical term. Actually, 75 million. Now, what do we call this strategy? Black male. <laughs> you have to understand, I'm being very serious now. Every one of you want to figure out how to get in the blackmail business. You control a key supply. Boston Beer owns the spot in Bavaria that has the best hops. Today they own 2% of the beer market. You want to figure out where the constraint is in the industry. You, you want to have a patent. If you can defend it, you want to have the right URL. You want to have locked up the right location, the right corner within your town to put that restaurant or yoga studio or whatever the case might be. You need to own something that allows you to blackmail the market. You got Mark Cuban as your spokesperson. I'm sorry, all the rest of the suntanning salons are dead overnight uh, and the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. This was not lost on this young guy. He's getting ready to go back, save his baby. He's going to launch a device that anybody could have copied. By the way, he was a master at describing the job. What was the job the iPod could do for you? Put a thousand songs in your pocket. See that you got to You got to describe what you do that simply. 
to the market. But people could have copied this. So what did he do? He went to Bill Gates and said, Bill, I need you to give me 150 million bucks. Bill said, yes. Why did he do it? Because he understood Bill's constraint. Bill's constraint was monopolistic pressures. And if Apple goes out of business, it's going to cost Bill billions. So Steve understood that about Bill. People are not logical. They're psychological. He gets 150 million. Then he uses that money and locks up the worldwide rights to this proprietary Toshiba flash drive that only one you know, only Toshiba made. And as a result, he was able to launch this product. Nobody could copy it. And the rest is history. He got the company turned around. It wasn't lost on this guy, Elon Musk, this case study. And I think he's not going to make it ultimately in electric cars or solar or any of that. But he doesn't care because what he, he knows the constraint in both of those is the battery. And if you can get the battery technology right, which is where he's putting billions of our U.S. dollars, then he can be the intel inside every car and every home and every business with solar and electric. What is that? What's the front domino that you've got to push over? And once you figure that out, now it's time for you to climb. I've got the right name for the company. I've branded what it is we do. I under, I've figured out how to make it easy for people to do business with us. I can describe very simply the job we do for them that's going to make their life easy. A thousand songs in their pocket. I'm going to promise to do it in three ways. Very safe. Very convenient. You know, fast, very convenient, and I'm going to start to climb. And it's not a straight line. Simon Lin, one of my early clients out of Malaysia, who does commercial building cleaning. It's not Facebook or Google. He cleans buildings. And he's kept a chart all along the way of his climb through the Asian financial crisis, the subprime crisis. There's not a straight line in history. It's tough to get up that wall. If it was, more than 1% of companies would do it on the planet. And so I want to take you to Galway, Ireland, to my buddy, Gene Brown. Gene's hauling trash in a small town. He's got 60 employees. And he says, you know what? I want to go big. And so he comes to our workshop. He says, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I want a million customers in the next 10 years. He was there in 2010 in Florida. And by the way, I'm going to put it in perspective. There's only 70,000 people in Galway, Ireland. There's only 100,000 households in all of Dublin. He's doesn't, not going to get anything like 100% market share. He's going to have to move through Ireland, Great Britain, across Europe, into the Middle East. But he starts the climb. And the most important thing is for you to figure out what you have to do next. And that's what you have to figure out while you're here. What do I have to do in the next 90 days? I don't, you don't need to see out any further than that. That's as far out as Mark Zuckerberg thinks. He has a BHAG. But then what do I have to do the next 90 days? He says, you know, I just need more cash. I need to figure out how to get 40,000 more a month flowing in here. And so he turned it into a game. He put it out to all 60 of his employees. And, and sure enough, they did it. And then, and by the way, he put up charts that they would track. And next, he then figured out, we got to start working more as a team. And I'm going to track 180 work sharing days over the next 90 days. Then I forgot to figure out how do we get rid of stupid stuff that we're doing. And that's what he figured out that 90 days. And he even took one 90-day period and said, let's figure out how to price right. Let's get the pricing. And, and they were able to average increase their price 7% per customer, which went right to the bottom line by rethinking it. No one has the same price. That's one mistake, by the way, you all make. You think your price should be the same for everyone. The airline industry has been massively a losing industry for decades. For the last four years, has been their most profitable in history. As one CEO of a major airline said, if I have 1,500 people flying in one day between Milan and Pula, on the routes, and there's only 1,200 different prices. I've screwed up 300 times. That's why you have all these options to buy this and that and early and the price changes. That industry figured it out. You need to as well. And the technologies are easy to do it. He even did one around culture. We called it cool, not cool. And so it's all about the next 90 days. Cash. Take a moment. What do you need to get done in the next 90 days? What's the most important thing? Mark Zuckerberg knew it was to get mobile. Gene Brown said, I got to get some more cash in the door. Virtual Technology Corp., I need to get 16 more people hired. He found the only 20 on the planet that could do what he could do. Raytheon, the next year, bought his company for a gazillion dollars. Where's the constraint you need to lock up? What do you need to do in the next few months? 
I need to hire someone to do my PowerPoints. <laughs> All right. Got about five minutes. Let's wrap up with cash. And it is king, and I just want to recommend a book. Uh, it's the best book on this topic, written by a dear friend of mine, John Mullins, a serial entrepreneur who then uh, two decades ago turned in to become a professor at London Business School. Uh, his is one of the courses that we offer out there called The Customer Funded Business. L let's get really clear. 99.99% of us are not going to get venture capital. And I got to tell you, getting money from friends, families, and fools is tough and dangerous. The best capital to get to scale is from your customers. So I want to end with a story that ties everything together I've been talking about. I want to take you back down under to Australia. As you can see, I have a love affair for that country. I actually have a great brand down there. And this father-son team, first of all, recognize a big trend that people want to eat. Well, healthy, but more importantly, local, local. And it's particularly important you eat local honey that's produced from flowers that are local because nature puts local what it is you most need to deal with the diseases and the other stuff that might be local. But it's not easy to do your own honey. And so they invented this device they called the flow. Now, who invented it? The father or the son, based on what I said earlier. The father, right? He had the infinite years experience. The son figured out how to 3D print it. So they didn't have to build up a big manufacturing facility. Now they need to raise $70,000 to get it going. Now they could go to friends, families, and fools. But today we have these places called crowdfunding sites, right? They're not crowdfunding. It's pre-sales. And so Kickstarter is the U.S. Indiegogo is the one that's more global. So they put it up on Indiegogo. They hit a quarter million dollars in 15 minutes and hit their first million in three hours. They qualified now for membership in EO. Normally it takes longer than three hours to generate your first million in revenue. They doubled revenue in the next 11 hours. Normally it takes more than a half a day to go to two million. And when the dust settled, they had sold 30 days later over $12 million. It's the most successful Indiegogo campaign in the history uh, to 36,000 people, there was her goal, 70,000. And notice their, their proposition. Harvesting honey is right on, both, on everybody. There it is. Now, here's the backstory. Who was the marketer? The son. Did they have a big marketing budget? No. You know what he did? He had been in my workshop. He takes out a piece of paper. What's he do? Writes down the top 25 influencers in the we like to eat what we kill space and grow and like. His guess were those 25 were reaching about 3 million advocates of people who want to eat what they raise and do themselves. And all he did was nurture a relationship with them. Put on the, hey, I'm a cute kid out of Australia trying to solve this complex problem so people can eat local honey. And then he stayed in touch with it. Hey, we're launching in three months, two months, next month, next week, tomorrow, next hour. They drove the first quarter million, the next million, the next two million. He's nurturing relationships, by the way, with some of the bigger local media in Australia who are watching this in the national and international media. And he obviously he had built a relationship with the folks directly at Indiegogo. So as this thing starting to take off now, Indiegogo takes over and they're publicizing and CNN publicizes it. And what their entire marketing budget was? Zero drive their first 12 million in revenue. They have Flow2 out. Uh, very successful company today in Australia. You can look them up. And in 2015, the innovation award for the globe was given to Elon Musk for the Tesla. In 2016, the innovation award for the globe was given to this father-son team for the Flow. Look, if they can do it, you can do it. All right, I've taught you what you need to know. Now, I want to be a little philosophical as we wrap up. 
So I launched my company. We went to half a million, million, two million, four million, getting ready to do eight million, and then 9-11 hit, and I lost a million bucks overnight. I was definitely losing money in the late 90s, as you're supposed to, and boom. But our EO chapter was bringing in this guy, Robert Kurosaki, and I learned that if you want to make a ton of money, 2,000 pounds of money, you got to give away 200 first. And Robert said, look, your rich dads that he knew, when they got in financial trouble, would fuel the pump by giving away sincerely to their favorite charity to get the, prime, the pump primed. And so a charity I'm involved with is doing the largest capital campaign in its history. And they come to me thinking I'm rich and I'm broke. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try it. And I committed to a sum of money over the next 36 months that I couldn't even dream to give away, let alone earn myself. And it was crazy. It worked. The modern version of that is Adam Grant's give and take. You got to be careful, though, how you give, because givers can be taken advantage of. So even how you sponsor things and all of that, so there's some real detail around it. But it was this woman, Lynn Twist, who ultimately taught me about money. And you got to get right with money, folks. you got to get this right in your head, because a lot of us grew up with really screwed up ideas around money from our families. Money is like water. Water is life. Yet if you let it go stagnant, it will kill you. The same with money. you got to keep it flowing. you got to keep the momentum going. And the more you put out for your people to the marketplace, but in the right way, the more will come back. So let me wrap. Four practical ideas. Number one, whatever you're facing, get a piece of paper out and make the list and start working the list. It's through others, brands, relationships, influence that you get stuff done, including a kid and his father in Australia. Number two, ultimately bland strategy is about what word or two you can own in the minds of the marketplace. What is it ultimately you can make easy for someone? In this case, harvesting honey. And they, they called it the flow. It had a name. Oh, we got the flow. Number three, how do you focus your effort? You understand what is the biggest constraint. For you to try to go after any but the weakest link at this moment is a waste of your time, effort, and money. And so go to the constraint. Not the weakness, to the constraint. And last, what is the universal truth about making a lot of money? You absolutely have to give first. And so if you can pull the A team together and have this one page clear, simply stated strategy vision, and then get a set of these routines in place, and this is the stuff that Daniel's gonna go through with you, then you can start to move. The key though is to have a bias for action. If you're gonna sit here and just take notes and not do anything, I hope some of you have already made decisions and have already texted back to your team decisions you've made and things you're gonna change when you get back. Don't wait till the end of three weeks. You got today. On the planes of hesitation, Bleach the bones of countless millions who at the dawn of victory lay down to rest and in resting die. That's, that's kind of morbid, isn't it? But that's reality. It's a little bit better. The founder of Habitat for Humanity. It's easier to act yourself in a new way than it is to think yourself in a new way of acting. And so you've got to do with those three things. Joel, let's end with this, this video. Give me all you got, my friend. <laughs>
Look, governments never solved a single problem on the planet. Entrepreneurs do, all right? We are the job generators. This city just lost 2,000 jobs last week because their shipping thing went bankrupt. It's, it's disastrous. And the only thing that's going to save the city is get a bunch of entrepreneurs, and they're going to be invited in as part of the, being local guests uh, to be a part of this. But look, you're the innovators. You're the job generators. You're the unsung heroes of your communities. So I want you to have fun over the next three weeks. I hope you had some fun today and laughed with me. I appreciate that. But this is serious business, and, and I know the pressures that you're under. I've been there, okay? And so Godspeed. Good luck out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.